All right. Uh, any technical difficulties? Can everyone see my screen? Um, let me find the chat. Uh, did you hit record? Because I don't, I don't think it did. It didn't record. All right. Let's go back to screen sharing. It says recording on mine. This okay. Session. Okay. Yeah. Usually it shows up on mine, but it didn't this time. But yeah, if it's on your end, then you're good. <laughs> okay. Open chat. Let's go away all the time. All right. So, uh, welcome to um, day two um, of Quashi Virtual University on snow hydrology. Um, here we have a picture of a snow pit that was dug by Simon Philhole in Alaska. And if you dig a snow pit on both sides really thin, you can get it backlit and look through and see what all the snow crystals and layers look like. Um, Today we'll be talking about model architecture and about layers within the snowpack. What's happening inside what we often represent as just a white box. So where we are in the quarter, here is the schedule again. So today is October 8th. We'll be going over the structure of a model, the layers and the internal processes. Hopefully you all got your research profiles in. I noticed lots of people had great entries in the discussion. I want you today to start Homework one, realize that on Wednesday, your critique of the first reading is due. And homework one won't be due until the following Wednesday, October 17th. However, because this is a new online everything class, I want you to start because if there's problems, you need to tell me so I can fix them well in advance of the 17th. All right, just a little bit more on those course logistics. Um, Thank you again for the introductions in the discussion. Um, before Wednesday, October 7th, when we meet again, in addition to turning in your reading assignment, as part of homework one, I need you to log into hydroshare.pangeo.io, open the homework one files in the examples folder, and work through homework 1A, the introduction Python notebook, and homework 1B, the example iPython notebook. These are both put together um, by Bart Nyson and Andrew Bennett, as well as by a number of people working for Kwasi HydroShare to um, make the computer code available in the cloud and all of your computer results shareable, both with me and with each other and with anybody else you can imagine who might want to see them. Um, both of these two homeworks, um, are not technically difficult. They basically require reading through a lot of discussion in the notebook. And then when you get to the action rectangles in the IPython notebook, you hit shift enter to um, upload and download things and perform model simulations. I want to make sure everyone's able to make this work by next Wednesday. We'll discuss parts C and D, which are what you actually have to do for your homework one in class on Wednesday. Today we will introduce the concepts behind those, but we'll do the mechanics of how to run the model in class. So I wanna make sure if you have any questions on the first part, bring those, um, I guess you don't have to bring them, uh, have them in your head when you log in virtually on Wednesday. All right, so what are the goals for today? So um, basically, outline of what we're going to do today in module two is what happens inside a column of snow and we have a picture here on the left of a column of snow um last week we discussed the very simplest case and this was before i started digging in the snow a whole lot what i kind of imagined happened you know the snow starts melting at the top that's where the sun hits it melt water appears and the water appears out on the bottom and inside doesn't really matter so take a minute to type in the chat box when might this be an okay model? What might be a situation where it's totally fine to model melt appearing at the top of the snowpack, water immediately flowing out the bottom, and not bothering to uh, have any equations whatsoever about the inside of your snowpack? So some answers I can see here are a thin snowpack or a very shallow snowpack might take no time to get to the bottom. A uh, homogeneous snowpack where the whole inside might be the same. A, you know, 
homogeneous isothermal snowpack if it's already what's we well, often hear the words a uh, ripe snowpack um i see large time steps fully ripe isothermal um we're only worried about net input and output you know, basically if you have a, a shallow ripe snowpack um you're not worried about grain size changes all you care about is the outflow this is okay and there's a number number of models out there that are almost exactly like that where they don't worry about the inside of the snowpack at all and there are many cases where they work quite adequately um by the same token i think as you thought about cases where it might work you were also thinking about cases where it might not work right where you might care about what's happening inside the snowpack you might have a deep or cold snowpack where water at the top might get refrozen in the middle um, water might take time to percolate from the top to the bottom, or you might be using some kind of technique or process that matters. So here's my picture, forcing generates milk, water runs out the bottom. All right, so today let, let's look about what have people said in the literature about layers in a snowpack, what's published about when this matters. Let's go over a very shortly brief bit about snow grain evolution. We'll talk about model choices based on applications. Then we'll take a um, brief break and transfer to the, the model architecture and the equations of heat and liquid water transfer that we'll be working with. We'll talk a little bit about dealing, developing physical intuition and idealized simulations. And your first modeling assignment, which is homework one. And then if we have time, if we don't have time, we'll get to this Wednesday. We'll talk about the model architecture, including the numerics and the details. All right, so um, I still need to figure out exactly how to do a GoToMeeting survey. So for now, let's continue to use the chat because it works well for me. So um, well, I want you just to type in a number. So for just type A and a number, B a number, C a number. Um, so I want you to enter the number of layers you think your snow model should have if you are A, a hydrologist, B, a climate scientist, C, an avalanche forecaster, and D, someone using radar or microwave snow remote sensing. And you can uh, reply multiple times for each of A, B, C, or D with just your number of layers. So we have a wide, wide range of answers. So most people agree that if you're an avalanche forecaster, you want a lot of layers. I think um, everybody seems to agree there. Um, a lot of people um, seem to say hydrology should be anywhere from two to 10 for a hydrologist. Most of you said that a climate scientist needs fewer layers than a hydrologist with uh, three, uh, two, um, one. And the majority of you had fewer layers for someone doing satellite microwave remote sensing. So um, let's go to what, um, at uh, a meeting last February, Charles Spears, who is, he's worked with a lot with the development of the snowpack model. He's an avalanche scientist um, from SLF in DeVos. And um, he gave a presentation where he came up with these numbers. So he said hydrology only needed one layer because we could just assume an isothermal snowpack. So he seemed to think hydrology, and he's not a hydrologist, but he thought that hydrology was fine with a single layer. GCMs and RCMs, and that stands for Global Climate Model and Regional Climate Model, 
typically do have five layers in them. Um, whether or not they need them is another question. Most of you put a lower number than five layers. Um, they're doing this because they really want to get the heat flux right through the snowpack. Most GCMs and RCMs are interested in insulation of the surface, what's happening to permafrost. They want to handle water percolation and phase changes, and they don't want more than five because they want to conserve computational cost. Um, Charles says you need at least 201 layers for an avalanche formation. I, I think he was uh, just pulled that number out of a hat. I think many when he said a lot of layers or as many as you can um, was correct. Because once you're doing avalanche formation, you need to be able to get um, water percolation, thin ice layers. You also need the brain evolution, right? You need to be able to model the microstructure and the metamorphism. You need to understand the structure of the density, the liquid water content, the sphericity of the snow grains, um, the specific surface area, and the grain and bond size. You also really need to recognize weak layers that are critical for avalanche forecasts. The one thing that um, that I added, which um, is not a subject of this class, but is important to know, is that if you're using microwave or radar remote sensing, it's actually critical that you have ice layers and liquid water represented in your snow model or your remote sensing algorithm will not work. So actually a lot of remote sensors, um, not visible, but those using longer wavelengths, trying to look at the snow water content within a snowpack, need as many layers as an avalanche forecaster. So it's actually a very challenging model. So this is a graphic that Justin Flug put together. Um, and the question, you seem to um, diverge in how many layers does a hydrology model need? And it's not just the members of our class, it's the members of the entire hydrologic community. And what you see here is a graph or a table on the left where Justin has put together some of the most commonly used snow models with citations, and then it made a nice graphic that shows how many layers are in each one of the models. So they vary from Snow 17, which we talked about last week, which is a very simple single layer model, um, UEB, which is also a single layer model that has an interesting force restore temperature um, at the top, to DHSVM and VIC models you may have heard of that are two layers, no MP is three layers, and then up to the model we'll be using SUMA, you can enter a lot of different layers, um, and then snow model, which can be either single layer or variable layer. So a question that comes up quickly is, well, why is there so many differences? Why do people have such different layers? Um, we will be doing a homework assignment to answer this question. But before starting any homework assignment or research project, you know, what have other people commented on related to this? What can we find in the literature that says how many model layers we should have and why? So um, here's, here's a um, paper that Carl Lapo published in 2015. And he ran two different models, the UEB model on the left, which is a single layer model. It has a force restore surface temperature um, calculated in addition to the bulk temperature. Is it frozen? Okay, just went to the new screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see the new screen now. So, um, so we started with a single layer model and he also ran a variable layer model called Snow Therm, which was developed by Rachel Jordan and is fairly similar to the SUMA model structure we'll be using. So he gave them identical forcing and found that both could simulate the observed sweep well with the basic forcing. He then wanted to know what, what would the models do if he just biased the incoming long wave temperature. And we'll, we'll talk more on Wednesday about the temperature forcing, but you just imagine you're, you're forcing the surface with, uh, you know, you're increasing long wave, right? That's the equivalent of climate change. We could increase it by uh, multiple watts per meter squared Per day, this would be pretty extreme in the world of climate change. But um, what might happen? The interesting thing is that they responded very differently to these prescribed biases, um, where the UEB simulations were much more sensitive in terms of the, on the bottom in ENF, you can see this is how the surface temperature changed in responses to these bias forcing. 
And then in the top A and B, you can see this is how the SWE simulation changed as a response to those biases and forcing. So why? Anyone have any ideas? Type, type your ideas in the chat box. So Justin says thermal inertia. Maybe it's because it's a single layer. Maybe it was parameterization of some of the other variables. Differences in the internal thermodynamics. I think one of the, the things we see quickly here is that we have, this is what we talked about on Wednesday, we have two models with a lot of things different about them. Um, and so we can come up with ideas here about what it might be. It could be because of the layering. It could be because of something else. But because so many factors differ before these models, Carl was unable to say exactly why. He could say they're different. He could say, here's a lot of ideas, but he could not actually pin down why. We need to do a controlled experiment. And so part of your homework, you can um, perturb only the layers and nothing else in SUMA and see if it could be explained by the layers. And you can perturb other things and see if you could explain this difference there. All right, here, here's another mystery. So here, question? I hear someone's voice. I can't see hands, so you, I can only see the chat box. So if you want to ask a question. No, it was just a mute thing. Okay, all right. So, so here is another um, mystery. So this is a um, study by Nicoletta Cristia. Um, her paper is in preparation. And she was modeling in um, Tuolumne Meadows. You see? Yeah, you're all okay. She was modeling in Tuolumne Meadows in Yosemite National Park in California. And she was using a two-layer DHSVM model. And here in C on the left, you can see Nicoletta's representation of this model. Um, it has a skin depth and it has a bulk snow depth. And she found with her two layer model that if she kept everything else constant, so hers was a controlled simulation, she only used one model, and she just changed the thickness of the skin layer, she could shift the melting of the snowpack by a month and shift the runoff in the stream earlier by about a month. So, so why do you think this was? So Ava says the skin layer acts as a blanket for the bulk snowpack. So if you have a really thick surface layer, the, the bottom is insulated more or less likely to melt. Any other ideas? All right, again, we'll we'll get more insight as we start doing our homework and looking under the hood of our snow models. Uh, Joran says energy transfer between the layers and with the surroundings. So this thickness surface layer is controlling feedback energy balance. So the wind was the same between the models. So the only thing that changed was the surface. Okay, so let's look at another paper. So this is a 2012 paper by Emmanuel Dutra that talks about the complexity of snow schemes in a climate model and its impact on surface energy and hydrology. So what you see here is um, he takes three snow models and they're all coupled to the same atmospheric model. So they all have the same forcing, the same boundary conditions. And the first, the control model, CTR, has differences in the liquid water vapor, liquid water representation. It's basically not there, the snow is always dry. It has differences in the snow density and it has differences in the snow albedo. 
However, the other two, the OPER, which is their operational model, and ML3, where they now let their have instead of one layer, three snow layers, are basically the same in all other aspects, but differ just in the number of layers. So what you see is here is their graph. So the first is they compared their simulations against data in Coldeport, France, which is a very nice data set um, that you will see that lots of people compare their model simulations to because it's long term and very highly controlled. And so the first thing you'll notice is that the density, so that's B and E, seems to improve more with the parameterization than with the number of layers. As long as you have a decent density parameterization, it doesn't look too far off the observations, which are the circle. Mm -hmm. However, um, and there's little difference between the number of layers. And you can see the legend is in C in the lower left-hand corner. So the circles are observations and the squares are observations. The dark line is the three-layer model and the gray is the control and the operational model, which is like three-layer model, except in terms of one layer is the thin line. However, what you also can see is that the snow water equivalent and the runoff, particularly with regards to midwinter melt, have improved by having three layers rather than just one layer. So in terms of answering our question, that is all I was able to find in the literature. So you guys in the process of this class are going to discover new things, and you can go on to write great papers about them. Um, I'm going to briefly cover snow crystals and then feedback again from somebody. Um, we're going to briefly cover snow crystals and metamorphism, but we are not going to go into how to model them. Um, we are going to focus on the thermal, liquid, frozen, and density aspects of a layered snowpack, which in terms of a four-week class already feels pretty overwhelming. And for the homework, we're going to test how many layers a snow hydrologist might be. However, for detailed, as in 201 layer snow modeling and measurements, I wanted to make sure everyone here was aware that their applications open until October 30th for the European Snow Science Winter School. Um, it goes into both measurements and modeling and talks about modeling snow crystal evolution. And the link is here. It will be in Finland and they will be studying snow on sea ice this year. I'm gonna draw just very briefly from the European Snow Winter School last year. So you have some basic ideas of what, when you might wanna to switch to a model that really deals with crystals and metamorphism. Uh, so first credit to this slide from Martin Schneebly, who is at SLF, who started out in material science. And so he thinks about snow from a material science perspective. Um, there's a, a link here to his website, which has a lot of cool graphics and a lot of cool movies. And the thing he says is when, is if you think like a material science about snow, um, material science has something they call homologous temperature, which is a measurement of how close the temperature of an object that it is, is to its melting point. And there's a lot of things done in material site to change things. They're called hot materials um, with sintering as you heat up a material and it starts you know, changing form and doing some interesting things when it gets to a homologous temperature greater than 0 0.6. You can also find in material science that creep, um, just something moving, stops being a solid in materials with a homologous temperature greater than 0.4. So now snow, if you look in the yellow box in the corner, Snow is so close to its melting point all the time in nature that it acts as a hot material. It creeps, it flows. It's a viscoelastic fluid more than a solid. And so when you really think about snow, it's incredibly complicated because it's hanging out so close to its melting temperature. Um, Martin points out that ice only behaves at a normal material, which are most things close to homologous temperature of 0.6 or lower, if it's at negative 109 degrees Celsius, which means it has to be on Mars. So nowhere on Earth is snow a normal material by material science standpoint. All right, so to try to help us understand this incredibly complicated material, um, Martin Schneebel and his group at SLF have a CT scanner 
and they've been scanning snow. And so what you see here are um, two pictures from the T CT scanner of snow. And if you go to either the US or the European snow school where you're digging in the snowpack, you'll be pulling out snow crystals, looking at them under a microscope. I, I've done that for years and I still say that they're, they're nowhere near as cool as what you actually can see in a CT scanner because you start melting them so quickly. Um, the edge length of both of these cubes is five millimeters and the age difference is one year. So these were kept in isothermal conditions, no changing temperatures and just left to itself snow grains will tend to become rounded with time. Um, basically, the um, snow will sublimate off the pointy ends of crystals and deposit in um, crevices until you get towards rounded snow grains with time. Okay, now in the real world, we don't have isothermal conditions. We have um, temperature gradients and snow metamorphism. So in nature, in general, snow will insulate the ground so it's often near zero degrees Celsius. And winter temperatures at the snow surface can be quite cold, up to let's say negative 20 degrees Celsius. So water vapor is gonna sublimate from the warmer snow near the ground and deposit in the colder snow nearer the surface. So um, again, um, before I show you the answer, what is what would you expect if this were to be kept constant over some time, or we kept the ground near zero, the surface near negative 20, had this process, what would you expect would be the density structure that would evolve in this snowpack? So um, go ahead and type in the chat box what you think about the density structure. And I, while you're doing that, I'm gonna put on my screen a movie from SLF. This is the link if you wanna watch it later. Um, when they held snow constant at a temperature gradient of five degrees C per 10 centimeters. And so here. So this is a picture of snow with a temperature gradient. It's colder near the top, it's warmer near the bottom. Does it work? Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's actually, um, in the cases of a temperature gradient, you are forming um, pore crystals or um, depth pore, which will form in the bottom of your snowpack. And then we get a free ad because it's YouTube. Okay. All right. Your learning experience is important. Oh, no. We get it. At DeVry, you'll do more than just oh, learn. You'll experience. Experience hands-on learning, collaboration. Okay. We'll make you to go away. All right. Okay. So, um, so I've got answers ranging from less dense towards the ground, the upside down snowpack. 0.8, snow is never as dense as 0 0.8. Um, closer to the, the ground, the denser you get, that's actually, I think, the right side up snowpack. And here's density is inversely proportional to that. So here is actually a picture of what, actually, what arises in that kind of strong temperature gradient. So here in the lower 48 states, we're used to strong diurnal cycles, right? It's cold at night, it's warm during the day. But if you start going up into the Arctic, um, you can get large areas where the sun just doesn't come up. The snow is insulating the ground and it, it is close to very cold, negative 20 C on the surface and warmer underneath. And those crystals are moving from the depth to the top and you end up getting depth hoar. And again, if you go out and dig in this type of snowpack, this is snow that you just touch and it crumbles to your fingertips. It's very low density. If you look at it under a microscope, you see this picture in the lower right hand corner and then much denser snow on top here. Um, this slide is thank you to Florent Domine who um, presented it last year at the European Snow School. And again, you can see this is, it's fairly shallow. And so over just 20 centimeters, there's a very drastic temperature gradient and this is what causes the snow to evolve. Um, you can see this in the temperature gradient of um, basically the saturated vapor pressure 
over snow at negative eight is 344 pascals. If you go down to um, negative 35, it's as low as 18 pascals. And so you're just driving a gradient of water vapor from um, high to low and getting deposition in the colder snow, strong water vapor flux. Um, here again is, is Florence picture of how this is happening. If the atmosphere is at negative 20, the ground is at zero. The edges are all coming off of these uh, snowflakes deposited from the sky and you're getting horned up crystals and a water vapor flux depositing water at the top, which leads us to the density in the upper layer is getting denser with time due to this flux and the density of the lower layer as it converts to depth or is actually getting lower. This is the concern in the Arctic. It's also concern um, in avalanche forecasting that this depth or is a very weak layer and um, you can get avalanches if this forms in your snowpack. All right, so take another minute to chat in the chat box. How do you expect the thermal conductivity of these two layers to differ. So how well do you think heat is transferred? Is it going to be transferred more effectively through your top layer with a higher density or through your bottom layer with the lower density? We seem to be pretty evenly split in our votes here. <laughs> All right. So to the explanation, um, I see a pretty even number of votes for both the top and the upper layer. The people who voted for the top layer having a higher thermal conductivity say that heat is transferred through the top layer more efficiently due to higher material density. So um so let's think, how does, how does insulation work in your walls or with a double pane window? What, what material are you putting in to try to um, slow down thermal conductivity? Yeah, insulation is air pockets. So which of these two layers do we think has a lot more air in it? the bottom has more air everybody agree on that so so the bottom with more air in it is actually a better insulator so which one has the higher thermal conductivity top all right and any questions if anyone thinks i'm saying something wrong you can you can type i think you can also type like secret messages to me if you don't want everyone to know that you're telling me i'm wrong i can voice your concerns without your name being attached i guess everybody everybody's okay all right all right so here um here are some pictures again this is a slide from Florent, who does a lot of work in the arctic and um you can see that you know when you dig these snow pits um the differences in temperature in the arctic so here's this is very cold bottom at uh, negative 25 and then there's a layer going down to negative 43 i'm glad i wasn't digging that snow pit it would have been way too cold as opposed to when we were in the alps the temperature varied between you know negative one half and negative four and a half so it's really the gradients there are so much smaller and and a lot of the places in the lower 48 states where we think about hydrology we are dealing with most of the time much smaller temperature gradients than you would ever get in the arctic and so we can for many of our purposes ignore a lot of the grain growth physics however you should think about where you're going and what model you're picking when you're going there because there are cases where it could be really important and so for the last slide in this module um, I'm going to leave you with, with something that really hit me home when I visited Matthew Sturm up in Barrow, Alaska. So on the left here, you see a picture of Matthew in the typical Arctic snowpack, which 
takes no time to dig whatsoever. And then on the right, you see a picture of me with Johnston Barris, who works for the Washington Department of Transportation Avalanche Service. And um, he helped me dig this snow pit, which is you know two meters, quite a bit taller than I am. And the first thing when I visited Matthew was just like, wait, my snow is different from your snow. Um, and so the, in the middle here is a graphic from Matthew Storm's paper about snow classes. And um, you can see these, these little, uh, these little triangle things that look like tents at the bottom of the tundra, taiga, and alpine snow all represent depth core, whereas uh, these little um, black colors represent ice and flow fingers in the maritime snowpack. And so both the snow depth and the composition of the snowpack and the changes in that composition are going to vary between where you are. So in this class, we are going to be using a modular model so it has a lot of choices it does not have every choice that you could want it's a model of intermediate complexity we are not modeling evaporation and grain growth and deposition as i just talked about being a dominant process um, in the arctic snowpacks or in the development of depth core layers so it's designed primarily for hydrologic applications in the mid latitudes to date it's been tested primarily in the continental u.s so think about your application and what processes you are trying to represent. And if grain growth and layer discontinuities are important to you, for example, if you really need to understand the Arctic snowpack evolution, if you need to model avalanches, or if you have a remote sensing application that is sensitive to layers in the snowpack, you will need the details we cover in this class, plus a lot more that I won't get to. All right, I'm going to switch to equations while I switch that. Um, are there any questions? Feel free to type questions or turn your voice on and talk is also fine. All right. Okay, so um, so now we're continuing with equations for heat and water transfer. Um, this is another picture of a backlit snow pit. If you are ever digging snow pits and want good pictures, I highly recommend it. And it's a good way just to look at um, Basically, the, the scale here is this was a picture taken in Grand Mesa, Colorado, and this top layer that you can see that's kind of deformed is actually where snowmobile tracks went across and compressed the upper layer of snow. And then you can see going down within the snow, but you actually see the where the shovel cut away here. And then the different layers just from each snowfall event puts a slightly different grain structure of snow. All right. So um, now we're going to get into um, the physical equations. So where we left off last week was what Martin called the starting point, right? The starting point are the governing equations that describe the temporal evolution of the thermodynamic and hydrologic states. And basically, we are going back to um, what you probably remember from Physics 101 is thermodynamics, which is conservation of energy, any change in temperature within the snowpack um, is either done by physically changing the temperature, by changing the state, melting or freezing portions of the snowpack, and by the fluxes at the boundaries. And we're gonna come back to this, where then there's conservation of mass, which is your volumetric liquid water content, your change in liquid water in the snow with time, is a function of melting and freezing within the snowpack, which is a function of the fluxes of the boundaries, how much is in versus out, plus however much is evaporating or being taken away, which is just handled separately from the fluxes. It could also be represented as a flux of the top boundary. And then similarly, the volumetric ice content where um, liquid water can convert to ice and vice versa. Because again, our one of our greatest problems with the snowpack is we're right at that melting point most of the time. 
All right. Simplify things. Fluxes, again, are only defined in the vertical dimension, so we'll only think about vertical columns. And um, we will worry about spatial variability later in the quarter. So the first thing you try to get to know your model, so this is from your reading assignment, and um, things to note whenever you're reading one. Uh, let's see if I can, am I right in this or no? So, nope, I can't write on it. All right, I won't write on it. No, 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 no. Okay. So the um, Z is positive downward in this model. H defines the height above the soil surface. So where Z equals zero and H equals zero is define the height of the soil surface. Does it not show up? It's showing me something now. It's just behind. Okay. All right. All right. So, is anyone having trouble? Oh. So nice. Let's see. I'm just sharing my screen again. All right. Is anyone having trouble with the screen? Does everyone see a screen that say variables and definitions? You see the presenter view? It's very small. Okay, yeah. now it looks good. No, now I'm like, you see the presenter view with the timer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Wait. No, that's it. No, screen two. Okay. Now I have a back screen. Now what? Now what do you see? Now you see. Okay, let's try. Let's see. Okay. Now what do you see? It's trying. Trying. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Apologies. All right. We see variables and definitions, which, you know, it's kind of a boring slide to work so hard to see. Apologies. All right. So um, our control volumes within the model are represented as a mixture of constituents. So when you start seeing thetas in all these equations, theta sub k is the volumetric fraction of the kth constituent, where the subscripts you'll see liquid ice vegetation are what it is. This theta is unitless. And so it's just what fraction of our control volume is made up of each thing. And in snow, as we discussed looking at the pictures, you can have solid ice, you can have liquid water, or you can have air. So we have a you know, fraction of air. The bulk density of the constituent K is related to the intrinsic density, which basically you can see the density of ice is 917, the density of liquid water is 1000 kilograms per meter cubed, and the bulk density of any piece of your snowpack is simply related to what fractions you have in it of ice and liquid, where we, for the purposes of what we do, don't worry about the um, density of air. Um, I have a degree in atmospheric science, so it seems bad to do that. But in the snow, it, it's almost nothing compared to ice and liquid, so we can ignore it. All right. Hello. All right. So in understanding these equations, let's start with a thermodynamic equation. And let's see, make sure we have some intuition about how these equations work. So first, let's simplify it. Let's think about a cold snowpack with no phase changes. So we get rid of the phase changes, and we basically have that a change in temperature with time is a function of the gradient of fluxes at the boundaries. So what does this mean? So let's start keeping it really simple. So let's start with a homogeneous single layer snowpack. So 
this is a boundary value problem. So it doesn't make sense to define any of these equations without also defining the boundaries. Um, and you can find online lots and lots of solutions to boundary value equations like this. I'm gonna go over some very simple ones, but everyone should know that with a little work on Google, you can find a dozen of physics professors who have successfully made YouTube videos deriving various things you can do with this equation. All right, so just to give everyone a little taste, so we've got a homogeneous single layer snowpack, flux of energy in, flux of energy out. Uh, remember in the, our model Z is positive downward. And so our change in temperature with time times the specific heat capacity is negative times this flux of energy at the bottom minus the flux of energy in. Okay, so quick quiz. And this is, do you remember from your prior classes, have I drawn a Newman or a Dirichlet boundary condition? And because I completely uh, understand if you don't remember, here are the definitions. So Dirichlet is a fixed boundary condition where you define the value at the boundary and Newman is a derivative or flux defined at the boundary. So given those definitions, what have I drawn? Go ahead and type. All right. Yes, yeah, so everyone got this is a Newman boundary condition. And this is the way that the SUMA model is set up, that we define the flux at the surface. And we will um, we will be talking about fluxes at the surface more next time. Right now, we're just going to pretend we magically know this. OK, so I circled it. Everybody agreed on that one. OK, so question one, if we have the same flux out as flux in, what is happening to the temperature inside the snowpack? So you just type one and uh, whatever you think happens. All right, everybody agrees that in, in this case, temperature is not changing, it's steady state, right? Steady state as long as flux is in out. Okay, if we have more flux of energy in than out and we're not going to allow any change of state. This is very cold. What's going to happen? So number two, what's happening in the temperature in the snowpack? Okay. All right. So everybody's everybody's good with our basic basic equations. Excellent. All right. So now let's let's take a minute and um, we'll look at the other boundary conditions just for a little bit of intuition. So I was showing you pictures from the Arctic um, with an example of, um, again, the sun disappears for the winter, it gets cold, it stays at negative 20 C all the time. The temperature at the bottom is fixed at zero degrees C. Note that I am now showing you virtually boundary conditions, which are different from our model, um, but is also you know, common in the numerics of solving the heat equation. Okay, so, um, I'm going to go ahead and draw a little graph for what the temperature is and put two dots on it. So at the bottom, I've got the temperature fixed at zero degrees C. At the top, the temperature is fixed at negative 20 degrees C. Um, I am forcing this due to omniscient powers because I'm the teacher right now. Um, it just stays fixed there forever. And um, the fluxes within the snowpack as a function of temperature, um, as we discussed last time, is a function here, the fluxes are equal to the thermal conductivity, lambda, times the gradient in temperature with depth. So again, the flux is energy balance at the surface, but everywhere inside the snowpack is just the gradient of temperature. All right. Okay, so question one, is the temperature inside this snowpack changing with time?
most everyone agrees, no, it's not changing with time. If this was not intuitive to you, you can find lots of lectures on this um, done with heat plates, mostly in physics classes. Um, so basically, because the temperature is fixed, because we're not allowing the boundaries to change at any point in time, the gradient across the two has to be fixed. And um, you know, the flux in must equal the flux out. The temperature is not changing to keep these boundary conditions constant. So you can't draw this, but just take a minute on some scratch paper you have or with your finger on your screen. How would you draw the temperature profile inside this snowpack? And yeah, I don't know how to do this in the chat box. And I think if I try to make you all share your screen, it will be a mess. So I'll just take a minute. And then I'll draw it. So does everyone agree? Is there any questions about how I drew the temperature in the snowpack? It's basically fixed at the top and the bottom. And the flux has to be the same everywhere inside the snowpack. I have a homogeneous snowpack, so my conductivity is the same everywhere within my snowpack. And so the flux, in the cases of only having temperature, is the gradient of the temperature profile. So with a constant conductivity, we need the same flux in the top as out the bottom. We need a straight line. That slope needs to be constant everywhere. There's the same flux moving throughout this entire snowpack, as long as we believe that I was able to keep these temperatures fixed at the top and bottom for all time. OK, so let's make it just a little bit more complicated. So we just showed an example of the Arctic snowpack. And we talked about the two layers in our Arctic snowpack having two very different thermal conductivities. Again, we have the temperature fixed at the top at negative 20 degrees C, the temperature fixed at the bottom at zero degrees C. Our two layers are of absolutely even thickness. And the um, conductivity of our lower layer, which is depth four full of air, is significantly less than the conductivity of our upper layer. So, is the temperature inside this snowpack changing with time? And then after you've typed an answer to that, again, on your scratch paper or screen or whatever you want, think about how you would draw the temperature profile inside this snowpack. There's more still not changing, right? As long as the boundary conditions are fixed, this has to be the same. So um, boundaries are fixed, spelled incorrectly. So temperatures are not changing. So again, our fluxes are constant. But now if we let Ti be the temperature at the interface, we could discretize our equation here of just our fluxes. Flux across layer one would be Ti minus T surface divided by the depth of our layer. It has to be the same because everything's fixed. Fluxes have to be constant throughout times lambda 2 flux in the bottom divided by Ti divided by dz. I said that like, the layers had to be even. So um, basically, our um, conductivity times the gradient of the top layer must equal our conductivity times the gradient of the second layer. So um, so if lambda 2 is much lower than lambda 1 because it's insulating, it's full of depth pore, where should I draw the steeper line? Where should we have a greater temperature gradient, in the top or the bottom layer?
So everyone agrees top. Now when I drew it, okay, explain to me why I'm wrong. So everyone agrees with the top. Mm -hmm. So I drew, someone can, if you guys, are, you guys all agree with each other and you disagree with me, so somebody's gonna have to help me out here. So what I thought was that lambda one is a big number, so ti minus t surface should be a small number. Lambda two is a small number, so t bottom minus ti should be a big number. A steeper line means a smaller gradient. You guys all agree. So I'm wrong. So somebody tell me why I'm wrong here. Are we agree with me? No, they do agree with me. So you all disagree with what you said before? <laughs> I don't understand. In my brain, that would be Oh, oh, okay. I just, it's what we're typing. Thank you, people. <laughs> it, it, it's words. Everybody agrees with how I drew it. It was just how you were saying it in the text box. Thank you. Okay. Question phrasing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Joy is a virtual online teaching. I'll get better with time. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. And I'm glad we all agree. Okay. All right. So now we are going to go to homework. 1D, this is the first homework you will do yourself. And on um, Wednesday, I will, um, I will walk you through the mechanics of how to do this. If you are excited, if you go and log into Pangeo and open the examples folder, it's already there, you can jump ahead. Um, I recommend just doing parts A and B start, and then we'll walk through it. So what you are going to do for your first homework is um, we're going to let the model discretize this equation as well as every other equation. We are going to change only the layering. We are going to um, start with the what is done in the Jordan range layering scheme, which is the um, snow therm model, which is have lots and lots of layers. This is, we will let SUMA have the 201 layers. Um, where do you find the homework? Uh, the homework will magically appear if you go to Pangeo. Now someone's calling me. Is someone in the class or somebody else? <laughs> okay, if they were, you're calling me from the class, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, where do you find, I would. Okay, so everybody is just so excited about the homework. So, <laughs> can you see my screen that shows the homework? Okay, it's loading. Wait a second, it will show up on my screen because multiple people are asking me, where is the homework? Okay, there it is, yeah. Okay, so what you see on my screen is homework one from the Kwasi Virtual University. Yes, you can see it, excellent. So um, what I am not sure if you can see, um, but let me escape here, is that up at the top, it says um, hydrashare.pangeo.io. Uh, Bart is also telling me that there's a Google Doc that has a link to it. So I will post the link to it on the Canvas page, and you can click on the link on the Canvas page. If you are um, so excited, you can honestly just type hydrashare.pangeo.io, and, um, <laughs> and when you get there, uh, you will enter it, and you will end up in um, the examples folder. If you open homework one, it has everything. You have homework one A, homework one B. I will post the Google Doc with all the directions in Canvas, and you can just click on it. Um, Bart says, don't worry, the Google Docs explain everything. All right. 
except what is a steep gradient, right? Uh, that's just confusing. Okay. All right. <laughs> it's slow. Okay. All right. So, so once you get in there, the first thing you'll do is follow the directions, figure out how to run the model. The directions will step you through and I will walk you through again on Wednesday how to configure the model so that it has these four different layering schemes. So um, that the first one is lots of thin layers. The second one is uh, CLM, your typical climate model, five layer snowpack. And then what you saw in Nicoletta's example, which is a two layer snowpack with a thinner and a thicker surface layer. All right. We are going to ask how well are adjustments to the heat equation represented as a function of the number and thickness of the layers. Um, again, where within the snowpack, you will have the same forcing on the tops, same everything else. We will have, um, it'll be how you're representing this gradient, which is represented by how finely you have your layers in the snowpack. So question, as we're trying to figure out how our snow simulation is sensitive to changing our number and thickness of the layers, what aspects might we want to look at and plot to understand the differences? What aspects of the snow simulation are likely to be sensitive here? So we're gonna, suggestions to look at the surface energy balance at the density of the snow. The energy flux, now we're prescribing the same boundary conditions of the incoming energy at the surface. How heat's absorbed in the snowpack. Melt might change. When might melt change? I think, think it'll matter more for the first melt of the season, the most intensive melt of the season. Um. Want to talk? The heat flux capacity within individual layers might change. So here are some things I thought of, and we will have the answers after we finish our homework. I thought the, the internal snow temperature is likely to be something we all want to plot. I think that what most of you meant um, when you were talking about the surface energy balance is that the snow surface temperature is going to change. And that won't change the incoming radiation, but it will change the outgoing long wave radiation. I think something that will be sensitive would be the fate of rain on the snow, particularly for a very deep cold snowpack, as well as the date of onset of snowmelt, when that snowpack is going to be isothermal. Remember at the very beginning, a lot of people said that, you know, it's not gonna matter at all if we have an isothermal snowpack, right? We don't have to, med we could just do no layers and melt water in the top magically goes out the bottom. At some point, I would think they are all going to look the same. And so we'll be figuring this out as part of homework one. We will be doing this at Reynolds Creek, which here is a picture of it. It's Reynolds Mountain East site in Idaho. It's a US Department of Agriculture site near Boise. And um, it's kind of, it's the sheltered site. It's rather sparsely forested, has a lot of um, instrumentation and um, here are references to where the data sets are coming from and a picture of within the entire Reynolds Creek watershed where the sheltered site is. It's called the sheltered site because actually the majority of this watershed is very wind blown. It's pretty open basin range um, terrain. And um, here's a picture of the US where it is in Southwest Idaho. All right. So in addition to um, looking at those layerings, we're going to be looking at how the heat matters 
The other thing that's going to come in is conservation of mass. Again, um, our transfer of water from the top to the bottom. And um, this is our liquid transfer. Change with time is gonna equal our liquid transfer from the top out the bottom. Same principles that we did with conservation of energy are going to apply here for conservation of mass. Um, the other thing that's going to come up once we start moving our liquid water through our snowpack and through our layers of our snowpack is that phase changes can occur. So something you might also be interested in plotting are, I talked about those constituents, right? Theta is your volumetric fraction of liquid and ice, and one can convert to the other at a time step, particularly when temperatures get close to the melting point. This um, became a very interesting story. This is a graphic by Justin Klug, who um, was modeling snow out in the Olympics, um, which is in Northwestern Washington. Um, if you ever get a chance to vacation there, I recommend it. And the observed is this black line of snow. And um, Ryan, William, William Ryan Courier had modeled it with Stuma and it matched perfectly. And we said, okay, it looks like a good spot. And Justin got um, snow model, which is another model and ran it off the shelf. And it suddenly said that with the same forcing data that there was 190 centimeters more snow at Bucking Horse. So that's about 3.8 meters in snow depth, which in terms of Justin's, that's two Justin's high. And these are Justin's slides, so he gets all the credit. So here's the model we're gonna be using. So you don't have to worry, it more or less works. But you, one of the strengths of this model that we found in our group is that it's very useful to try to figure out why another model might not work. So what on earth could have gone wrong here um, when, you know, if one model works, you often have decent forcing data. Um, so Justin put on his detective hat and he looked at the density and saw that, you know, the observed and the two model densities were not very different. However, the water coming out the bottom, cumulative runoff, was much higher for the SUMA snow model than for the snow model snow model, which we've asked Glenn to name it something else, but it's snow model. Okay, so um, what, what Justin discovered is that within snow model, when um, liquid water does not leave the snowpack until a density threshold is met. And the density threshold was is set pretty high. And what was happening is that, um, that in SUMA, the liquid water just percolated through the snowpack and came out all winter long. This is a site where it rains on the snowpack all winter long. And in snow model, as it was parameterized, nothing happened until this threshold was met right here and then suddenly runoff started. And so all of the liquid water was being saved inside the snowpack. And this was a very rare situation. Um, most people would agree that the Olympics are not like most snow conditions you would find anywhere else. It's um, one of the wettest places in the uh, continental US. And it's the reason the snow is there is because it just never stops snowing. It's very close to zero degrees all the time. So the other thing you're going to be looking at in your homework will be the meltwater flow exercise. So homework 1.0. So we'll be looking at layers and then we'll be looking at parameters of how meltwater can flow through a snowpack. So this is the flux equation that is within um, the SUMA snowpack model. And so the, um, the flux of snow is a function of um, the hydraulic conductivity of snow. It's a function of the liquid snow in the snowpack. It's a function of a tunable meltwater exponent, capillary retention, how much snow can be held against gravity drainage. And then basically the water just drains as a function of the pore space, how open is the snow, um, how fast can it move through the snow, and how do you parameterize this function? So we will be changing all three of these parameters 
Um, I will also next time show you a little bit more background on where these parameters came from and what they physically mean. From Justin, this percolation scheme, we will be using this formula with these parameters. We'll be changing the parameters within one formula or parameterization. What you should be aware of as you go to other SNOW models is that in addition to having very different layering, again, Justin gets all the credit here, they have very different percolation schemes. Um, so here's our SUMA model where snow is viewed as a porous medium undergoing gravity liquid water drainage. That was also done in the UAB model. Um, in snow model, SWE was just reduced as a function of maximum density, which you saw. In SNOW 17, it was just a liquid water holding capacity. And um, there's yet some other things with um, layer properties and capillary retention in snowpack and other models. So it's something you probably want to check. Um, this is Justin's picture of liquid water held within the space in between the snow grains that drains down through the snowpack to be similar to what happens in the SUMA model. All right, so before I go to the final module and we will finish it on Wednesday, we'll get through it all. Are there any, any questions? All right, it'll probably take me a minute to put my final PowerPoint slide. What's up? All right, we're fast now. All right, I have a question. Okay. Okay, are there models that incorporate variable layer thicknesses similar to a dynamic time step? Yes, we are getting there. Um, that's in this part when we talk about numerical methods. And um, most of the models that have any more than two layers have variable layer thicknesses. And one of the big model decisions is when you decide to join layers, to make two layers be one layer, or split layers and make them be separate layers. All right. So we went, we spent a, um, we spent a fair bit of time just looking at the basics of the heat equation. Um, I would recommend that as you're going through things, if you feel that um, you're, you're frustrated with the numerics, with the basics, that the heat equation is one of the most famous physics equations of all time. There are a lot of solutions to this. There's a lot of solutions, you know, basically the diffusion equation. Um, you can find lots of examples. It's also used in lots and lots of numerical techniques. So this is one of the basic um, cases we're doing within the course of a four-week class. I do not have time to go into all of the different ways. This was a very nice GitHub page I found. This is a link um, that has in a Python notebook. It goes through about eight different ways you can solve the heat equation with different boundary conditions and different time stepping and different solutions. Um, so one thing to be aware of with the heat equation is you know, we need to discretize it. So these are the equations from the paper that you read on the discretization that is in SUMA. Um, so basically J layer. And one thing you need to be aware of is that if you define the temperature in the middle of a layer, you are defining the fluxes at the boundaries of the layers. So you have a J plus one half and a J minus one half of those fluxes. Um, within SUMA, we also have something more complicated that we have, um, just as Tim asked, you know, do we incorporate variable layer thicknesses? We do, which means that in your numerical solution, your delta Zs are different for each layer. So you need to keep track of delta Z instead of bringing it out of your equation and your solution. Again, similarly to the flux of heat, the movement of moisture, which are these down here, um, this is um, your 
total amount of um, snow liquid water at layer J is function of the flux at half a layer up minus the flux. I guess notice the multiple negatives. Z is downward. Is there anything you want to remember? <laughs> flux out the bottom minus the flux in the top as we're counting down. Uh, again, um, these are things to be aware of. And if you notice problems in another model, look at how it's coded that the you can't just step through the heat flux equation. I'm going to move my water numerically from the top down one, down one. You actually have to solve for the gradients across. So you need numerical methods that handle all of these, which are generally done in matrices. OK, when you when you decide to use any model and you decide that you're having some kind of problem that you want to look under the hood, I would recommend that you start with the published paper. Hence here, you, I asked you to read um, Martin Clark's 2015. However, one thing to be aware of is that very few papers in the scientific literature ever discuss the numerics. Um, your model that you picked up could have time stepping issues. It could have numerical instabilities. It could break the laws of physics and you would not know from just reading the published paper. Therefore, to learn more, you want to look at the source code. Um, for SUMA, you can access all of the source code um, within the GitHub repository. Um, homework one, and I will post the link that gets you to homework one. Then once you're in homework one, it has a link that will get you to read the docs. Um, in the read the docs, you can um, go and download the entire source code. There's a folder that's labeled source. If you open um, the engine file, you will get a whole lot of .f90 files. That's because the basics of SUMA are built in Fortran 90. You can then open these in any text editor of your choice, and then you can figure it out. I would recommend just taking a look at the relevant source code for any model that you are seriously using in research or practice. Uh, don't, don't be scared of it, even if you're like, I don't use Fortran 90. I'll show you what they look like, and they're not so bad. So for example, if you go and open this, this code, you will see, you know, we've been talking a lot about thermal conductivity. So what does SUMA do for thermal conductivity? So this is in snowutils.f90. And if you open it up, it will start defining things. So it says, you know, lambda air, lambda ice, give us the thermal conductivity of air and ice. We're gonna make some model decisions. We can choose these three different papers. So they're cited, you could look up the papers of what these people did for thermal conductivity. And then you can see that for these three different cases, which would be choices you might make, that you get three different equations. So you know we pick one of these, and um, you know, say I'll use the bulk density of ice. You might wonder, you know, where does the bulk density of ice come from, right? Or else they were using this lambda of all the constituents. So what, what is the bulk density of ice? So um, when I find some variable that I, I want to know, I then um, go find things in multiple subroutines. If somebody has a, um, better way um, to do this, um, please let everybody know. Um, you guys are in charge of helping each other as well as helping um, me. All right, so in my files, I just opened the file search. So just um, your basic directory structure. And then I type find and um, I tell it to find what I want. So I notice that this is being called. All of these are um, being called in um, the thermal conductivity of snow. So I said, where does this come from? And it tells me where I found it in the first place. And then it tells me I can go to diagonal matrix E bar F90. So if I open that, it then is telling me um, where, and apologies, uh, this was where, it tells me the bulk density of ice somewhere in here. Don't worry about where. Um, you can similarly get the um, snow liquid flux code and see how that's time step. And Ava says you can just search keywords in the SUMA GitHub and just look at them right in the GitHub directly. 
Um, so here is, um, getting close to what I wanted to cover today. Um, so also these are within the um, SUMA paper. Take a look at how multiple slow layers and deforming coordinates are defined. Um, there is change in depth of the snow layer over a time interval as a function of compaction and of where it is. So um, in terms of um, plotting the output, it can be a little bit tricky. You have to track the layers. It's not always in the same place. Each layer is not in the same place in the coordinate system through time. And then just for a final graphic, again, this is just in slide comparing a number of models. You will see that the numerical solvers of all of these differ quite a bit. Um, so while the SUMA uses a newton rapson method for solving, many other models use a forward finite difference, which can um, sometimes be unstable. And so you want to think about how rapidly things are changing in your system. And if something weird happens, this could be an explanation. All right. Any, any questions? Um, also, if you have questions of what I should go back to and cover in more detail on Wednesday, feel free to post them on the discussion board to send me an email. And um, if you still see, and then this document on um, homework one will be posted by the end of the day. I think I just forgot to put it in the canvas. I'm getting slightly confused given where in virtual world different things were. Um, but I will put it up. All right. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your Monday. <laughs>